So we are thrilled to welcome Alex Hayslip, a program manager at ODE for uh, Safe Schools. And he's here today to talk to us about the drills and the, um, the processes that are happening in our schools and how we can work better uh, to make that happen. So Alex, uh, please unmute yourself and um, you may start sharing your screen. We've got an attentive audience of about 36 people right now who want to know about um, school safety. All right. Well, thank you, Deb, for that introduction and uh, good morning, everybody. I'll, I'll start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Alex Hazel. I'm the program manager for the School Safety and Emergency Management Program, the uh, uh, opening slide you see here. And uh, just like Deb was saying, I think this is this is an important aspect of, of just keeping our kids safe, uh, no matter what challenges they may face. And you all are an important part of that as well. Uh, so I'm glad I'm able to come in here and talk about this this morning and uh, provide you some helpful tips and things to consider when planning for and, and getting your kids uh, out of the building or even uh, remaining in the building safely, uh, no matter what the, the situation is. So um, today I want to talk about uh, uh, drills. We're going to go through uh, drills and essentially what uh, Deb and I were talking about uh, last month and before was uh, how important it is to use a trauma-informed uh, perspective when uh, engaging in, in drills and, and talking about these things with our kids. Uh, and, and this is adaptable no matter what uh, group you're working with, right? We've seen uh, constantly across the state and, and other places, even uh, nationally, as I've heard from other folks in other states, that uh, sometimes there's a reluctance to conduct drills because they can be traumatic, uh, jarring, um, even, even with whatever population, it doesn't matter you're, you're working with. And I want to say, hey, it's still important to, to get those drills done and to practice uh, uh, safe emergency procedures. Uh, but there's ways to do that without, uh, without traumatizing everybody in the process. So we'll talk about, a little bit about that today. So first, we'll talk about the, the drills, what drills we need to, to look at and, and conduct. Uh, talk about planning ahead, what things to consider before you start uh, start in on actually training and exercising some of these drills. And we'll say crawl, walk, run. Uh, you can use uh, whatever, you can adapt even these slides if you would like to. Slow, medium, fast. We heard, um, we heard uh, turtle, hair, cheetah. Whatever, whatever works for that is essentially what we want to talk about is easing the kids and, and even staff into these things so that the first time you hear that alarm is not uh, so jarring and disruptive. And then we'll talk about some additional considerations that you can use, some things that uh, that might be useful for you in the classroom and, and things to help you uh, get that creative spark going for, for applying some of these, these concepts. And then contacting and questions there at the end. So first I want to talk about the drills. What drills, right? These are the, these are the six, really technically seven, but uh, really six drills that... Uh, that are required in Oregon. Uh, now, and if you were to look at the ORS, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide, um, uh, one of them is a little bit out of order, not necessarily included, but the actual procedure is. So we'll go down the list, hold. This is this is a new one from the, uh, uh, actually I'll back up and, and say, what this is, I have got the I Love You Guys Foundation um, icon down there at the bottom. We are really pushing and, and would like to, to encourage every school district in Oregon to, to use the standard response protocols in their schools as, as their response uh, measures. Uh, because it does, like the name implies, it standardizes the language. So that if you move from one school to another, one school district to another, uh, when you hear the alert, you know exactly what, what needs to happen. So just for example, there you see that hold in your rooms or area, clear the halls. That should be said or spoken with the with the alert that goes out, so people know. Okay, this is this is what needs to happen, and it's not as confusing uh, from from one place to another. It also helps uh, law enforcement and fire emergency responders know. Hey, if we're conducting this uh, drill response, uh, they know what kind of uh, uh, situation they may be getting into. Right, so. Uh, the secure one is the one that is is updated language in the last couple of years. It's previously been called a lockout. 
and we found that uh, the lockout is oftentimes confused with lockdown, and we don't want people to be confused about that. So secure is, is the new new language that we are pushing, uh, and the I Love You Guys Foundation is pushing with their, their uh, standard response protocols, the latest guidance. And again, it's the same, the same basic principles and practices of lockout. Get inside, lock the outside doors. There's something outside that we don't want coming in, or maybe we want to control the, the student population in our schools. Uh, we won't want them getting out into a potentially dangerous situation that may be occurring outside, but it's not inside the building, so we'll call it secure. Lockdown is the normally the big scary one. We think somebody is inside the building. Again, you see here locks, lights out of sight. We're going to lock everything down, tell everybody to get uh, inside behind a locked door. That's the number one safest way to uh, get out of the way of a, a very dangerous person that who may be inside the building. Get the lights off and stay out of sight of, of any intruders that are in the building. And shelter, this is one that, that actually ties in with the, well, you see the earthquake and tsunami drills there at the bottom of this, this uh, second column here. Uh, because shelter, typically here in Oregon, we're going to be talking about an earthquake um, response, right? We're probably not going to be sheltering, uh, not typically sheltering for like a, a tornado or, or hurricane, right? But if, if we have an earthquake, we're going to shelter in place until that uh, earthquake is done, and then we're going to evacuate the building, right? So shelter is, is a very hazard and safety specific uh, situation. So know what your local area hazards and threats are and, and make sure that your, your folks are, are planning for those. And then evacuate, we all know evacuate. Well, oftentimes this is referred to as a fire drill, right? But there are a number of other reasons we might want to evacuate as well. So evacuate is just evacuate. It could be a, uh, maybe a gas leak inside the building or, or some other danger that inside the building, even following an earthquake, right? If uh, the, the structure is unsafe, we want to evacuate. So we'll call and evacuate for any kind of unsafe situation inside the building. And these are the drills that we're talking about that we want to make sure that we're, we're preparing our, our kids for no matter what population of kids uh, we're working with to, to ease them into it, not just uh, pop that alarm at the beginning of the year and, and run into, into it full speed. So a little bit of additional details here on this. Um, if you would like uh, to follow the annual drill recommendations that we have, you can check out our website and we'll have uh, links and, and contact information for you there here at the end. Uh, but uh, ORS 336071 is also on there and it specifies what kind of drills and how often. Uh, it's 30 minutes per month on school uh, emergency procedures that are required to uh, be trained in, and instructed in our classrooms here in Oregon. And they should cover the, the drills and procedures that we just addressed in the previous slide. So we'll talk about planning ahead. And, and I think about this, and I was a, a teacher for a few years, so, uh, and I'm, I'm sure some of you are, are also familiar with lessons plans, right? You wanna plan ahead, think about what, uh, how are you going to prepare your students uh, for the task ahead? So first, we wanna know what our immediate challenges are, what our, what our task is going to be, right? Know your people, both students and staff, right? It's not, I don't think it's good enough just to know, hey, um, we have we have one student with the what was it, Deb, a complex body. I like that terminology. It could encompass any any kind of challenge that a, that a student may face, right? And and if if you have staff, some some are going to be a little bit more robust and be able to help somebody who has fallen down, right? So know who who can help uh, in in a given situation if a major disaster occurs. Right, so know your people, both your students and staff, and know how, how to team them up appropriately when we need to either shelter, evacuate, or conduct any other uh, major response, drill response. Uh, there was a question um, in the oh. chat. Wendy, would you like to uh, pose that question? Sure. Uh, I, uh, when you just said about 30 minutes per month, is that like for each drill, or is it they just um they pick so many drills a month and like cycle through it that they just do a total of 30 minutes yeah um so it, it in the ors it specifically says it's just 30 minutes uh, on emergency procedures um you're supposed to do each one of these 
uh, throughout the year and uh, at least two earthquake drills. And depending upon if you're in a tsunami zone, uh, also a tsunami drill. Uh, it doesn't specify what that should look like. But if you're following this, we, we recommend following the standard response protocol so you do that. Um, on our website, like, like I said here, if you go there under the threat and hazard resources where you find some of our monthly communications as well, we actually have a drill recommendations and what, um, what topics to address each month that follows our communication as well and tells you what drill you can do that month that will help you stay in compliance throughout the year. But good, good question. Yeah, I, I, I know sometimes I'll, I'll gloss over things. So please, if it, if it sounds like I missed something, please let me know. Thanks for that. Yeah. So back to planning ahead. Um, I think it was a know your environment. And this is, this is an important component right here because um, oftentimes, and I've seen this even in, in uh, schools I've walked through recently, where uh, we only have one evacuation route. Well, that is probably not good enough. We probably want a primary and an alternate evacuation route. But in those situations, know what those look like and what challenges you might have with the kids that you have, right? If, if your primary or alternate evacuation route is, is going to be a hindrance for, say, a wheelchair-bound student, make those recommendations to your, to your uh, leadership and see if you can't either get it fixed so that it, it is accommodating or find another alternate route that is accommodating. I understand sometimes we're, we're not always, we're, we're bound by our environment, but know what your challenges are ahead of time and please plan ahead so that you're not surprised when, uh, when one of your routes is blocked and now you have to use it the other one. And well, shoot, we didn't, uh, we didn't plan for how we're gonna get a wheelchair out the other one. So, and never forgetting, Alex, as we said yesterday, never forgetting that the weather can be anything and uh, it, that route may be just fine in good weather. But if you now present a, de a deluge of water, um, is that route going to be too muddy for a wheelchair? Yes. No, good, good point, Deb. In well, fact, and, and yesterday even, uh, we were talking to someone in Ohio who does transportation, and she said uh, that they wanted to cancel a drill because it was snowing outside. <laughs> and they said, this is exactly when we should be having a drill. Exactly. But, thank you. Yeah, the, uh, uh, yeah, oftentimes assembly areas uh, following an evacuation are designated in fields that here in Oregon get muddy and rainy and wet, right, during the winter. Uh, we want to make sure that we have access to those for the, for the students who um, who might have additional challenges like your, your wheelchair-bound students, right? We want to make sure that they get out there safely and and be accommodated appropriately. And that's why we're also pushing that that those peeps, those personal emergency evacuation plans. And it's important to go through these steps on on these on these peeps so that again, it's it's a situation where we're thinking ahead, thinking ahead of what challenges we could have. And I put here in here, don't sweat the changes. And I think this is important because sometimes the plan that we have in place gets disrupted by something we, we uh, didn't think we were going to need to plan for, right? Like that rain or that snow uh, storm that Deb was just talking about. <clears throat> don't sweat the changes. The, the thing is, is we want to make sure that we're thinking about some of these things ahead of time so that some of those changes that we may encounter are less disruptive than they would have been if, had we not planned at all. So we'll talk about the, the crawl, walk, run method working uh, into how to, to present this information as we're going through the drills with our students. So what we're saying here is don't just hit the alarm, talk about it first. What do we wanna do and why? What, what's the purpose of some of these things? It's much less jarring and much less disruptive to, to a student or anybody, right? If we know what we're doing and why we're doing it ahead of time. So we wanna talk about that first and, and slow walk through, through what we're going to do. Here's where we're going to go. Here's how we're going to go there. And, and here's other ways we can get there. And then you do the alert, right? So we'll talk about these in order. Crawl, well, when I always, Liked was, I've seen so many different ways of, of how this is presented, right? You have your goals and objectives, your task and purpose, what and why. Explain the expectations and reasons for each drill, right? 
evacuation. We're going to get out the building very quickly. We need to do that because there might be a major danger present to ourselves inside the building. We want to get away from it, right? And a lockdown. There could be some dangerous person or even an animal inside of the building. We want to lock down, get out of sight, and turn off those lights so that they don't see us. Explain those goals and objectives as that task and person, the what and why ahead of time. Say, hey, here's what we're going to do when you hear the alarm for this or another drill so that they know what's going on ahead of time. I like this one because I think it's, it's, it's kind of funny. There was a, a story behind this picture and that they wanted to, to uh, throw kind of a, a, a wrench in the works, right, for an evacuation drill for, at a school. And they came up with this big poster to say fire area is blocked instead of just cluttering a bunch of, of chairs in the corner. Of course, the cluttering a bunch of chairs or other obstacles in the corner to simulate a, a blocked area probably wouldn't make the fire marshal very happy either. So this is a nice, easy way to doing that walkthrough portion of your drill without uh, causing undue obstruction if in case something actually happens while you're working on it. So try conducting, for, for your walkthrough, try conducting those evacuations or other drills without the alarm for the first time, right? If it is an evacuation, walk them out, show them what the route is, what is expected during the evacuation. Same thing with a lockdown or even a secure. What is expected when the lockdown drill is called? We want to get everybody into what corner of the room that you're in, right? Who's going to lock the door, turn off the lights, closest person to it? And then how do we make sure that we're, we're uh, seated and quiet during the lockdown, right? Do this without the alarm the first time around. So, so that the students and even yourself get a, get a sense of what it could look like. You can, see, you can probably start at the, in, even in a walkthrough like this, you can probably start to see some of those kids who are fidgeting a little bit more, a little bit more nervous, have other uh, issues. Figure out how that, that could be addressed or accommodated during the actual alert, right? I think uh, we talked about the, the fidget spinners, keeping those on hand, things, things of that nature, the, the uh, noise canceling headphones. If you have, have students with, uh, uh, who might be, have sensory issues as well, think, think, think of those things ahead of time. And you, when you're doing these walkthroughs, you can probably see where, where you might need some of those additional um, accommodations. And some kids need a, like a picture of mom or yeah. something that has mom's voice to help them calm, but making sure that everybody knows these things, including, as we said yesterday, even the bus driver uh, uh, who's going to be uh, transporting this student if, if you needed to. So, so many details and you know your students best. These things need to be somehow in their plan uh, so that people know about it. So we'll talk about what that distribution of this information might look like, Alex, because I have questions on what the standard things are that are happening around the state, but you know your students. What helps them calm down? Yes, yes, absolutely. Thanks, Deb. This last bullet I, I think is important because we, again, we want to plan for our primary and alternate in case that fire area is blocked. Walk both of those. Walk both of those ahead of time so that you know what challenges you might face with the students you have. Right. And then once we know that our students are comfortable with with the drill itself, we know the procedures, we practice them, we talked about them, and then we practice them at a very slower or medium pace. Run that drill. See, see what's going to happen when the, the alarm goes off itself and you have to actually run through the drill and do it at full speed. Talk with your students about the drill afterwards as well. There are things that happen during the drill that maybe were not perfect. Well, that's what the drill is for, right? This is a, a training exercise, essentially, right? Even at full speed, those drills are practice. So that when a real disaster happens, we know best how to respond to those disasters when they occur. So I, I, I always say this, don't, don't to look at a drill like, oh, we have to get it perfect every time. No, the, the pur purpose of those drills is practice. 
so that we can identify some of the shortcomings that we might have or, or things that we might not have thought about and incorporate that into our procedures or practice the next time we do that. So that's why it's important to always talk about that after you complete a drill. Hey, how did you feel about this? Did you feel like we, we got you in the right place at the right time? How would you feel if we had to stay in that assembly area for an extended period of time? These are some of the things that you could bring up. But again, have that conversation with your with your students after a drill is completed so that you can you can what we call uh, what we've called before is an after action review. Right. We want to do that every time we conduct any kind of exercise or drill, even if it's informal. We want to make sure that we get an idea or sense of what could be improved, what was great and what we need to keep doing. Right. So for some additional considerations, we've got some trauma informed practices. They start with engaging material, right? We want to make sure that the, the kids are engaged, that we're engaged, and we feel comfortable with, with what they are. <clears throat> I've got a couple of links here. and Hopefully, we can share these, these slides with you also after this is done so that you can get some of these links. And I can, um, uh, in the interim, during, during questions, I'll see if I can't just post some of the links in the chat as well so that uh, you can go. And there. I think that Chandra has posted the link to your handouts. We've got them uploaded for folks, so you should have it. Perfect. But yeah, we got you. We got your back, All right. Alex. All right. Thanks, Deb. So here's a link to some self-paced training. And then for a more creative approach, uh, one of our one of our own Claire Renette out of uh, Columbia Gorge. This is one of the things that she worked on in her, in her spare time as as kind of a companion piece for for teachers uh, who would like to or teachers or other staff who would like to introduce a more uh, trauma-informed practice by, you know, having that conversation with the kids about what and why of, of in this case, a lockdown drill is, is what her, her first uh, book is, is about. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a great way to introduce uh, some of these, these concepts. There, there are others that are available, too, that you can find. Uh, they're on, on Amazon and, and such. I think um, there, was, there was one that was recommended, Lockdown at Superhero School, or I, the, the name is escaping me now, but um, I've got them in the notes uh, section of this slide uh, are a couple of other um, good creative approach uh, kind of uh, uh, products or, or uh, materials that you can uh, find for your classroom if, if you so would like. And like I was saying at the beginning, you are part of the plan. You know your students best. Make sure that you're part of that that planning team as well. When when uh, your your school goes into that planning session for their emergency operations plan, or they're considering their next drill, make sure that your your voice is at the table because you need to let them know, hey, there might be challenges that you're not thinking of that we need to to consider during the next drill or the next exercise, right? Speak up, Alex. I wanted to make a point here too, if you don't mind. Is sure. you're part of the plan because you absolutely are the one who knows the student best, and you're considering all of these pieces. And part of that plan, of course, has to be helping other people to know that plan, and in circulating that. Because odds are, as a PT or somebody who may be a consult or not always there, odds are you may not be there when the emergency or evacuation is happening. So. So uh, coming up with a plan and, you know, really, uh, as always, relationship building and communication um, is key. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we, we've seen um, even in uh, school districts across the state where uh, the PT or, or other uh, instructor understands that there's a particular challenge, but it wasn't considered by the fall by the staff running the exercise or, or administrating the school in the first place. And then you get stuck with, uh, uh, in, in one case, I remember, it was even something as simple as they, they had all able-bodied students, but this one kid got a broken leg and they had to figure out, oh, how am I gonna get him down from the second floor? That's a pretty, it, it could happen to anybody in any, any situation. And it's Including us, enough. the temporary yeah. disability, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So even those considerations, those those one-off kind of challenges can sometimes throw a, a wrench in the works and you have to plan around those. But for you folks, please speak up, be part of that plan 
be engaged with your with your staff and say, hey, these these are these are considerations and obstacles that we might need to overcome when we're faced with the challenge of a disaster, no matter what it is. All right, so we'll finish up. We'll talk a little bit about the program. What we want to stress is that um, our intent is to involve the entire community, not only within the school community, but without as well. We want to make sure our, our local fire, EMS, our law enforcement know what our plans are and know how to uh, respond and help our, our school community out when uh, we're engaged and when we, we encounter those disasters. This is important because we're not going to encounter disasters in a bubble, right? We're going to have to rely on some of those outside resources as well. So include all members of the school. And why we're talking here today and why we stress some of these things, it's one of the one of the six pillars and one of the six things that we look for within any good high quality emergency operations plan is, is that school district accounting for accommodating disabled students and staff? Are they accommodating people with other access and functional needs? What are they doing? Are they using the PEEP? How do they have um, wheelchair access to all their primary and alternate evacuation routes? Do they have plans in place to accommodate everyone in their school, no matter what their challenges are? These are, these are things that are important for every emergency operations plan in every school district. So we're here to help. Please, you can contact me. You can contact your regional uh, uh, emergency management consultant for your school region. Uh, here's the, the, the link. You can scan it here. We'll, we'll, again, if the, they were shared out, it's easy to get there. We'll, we'll put up the links as well. But contact us. We're not only going to come out there and give you some good advice. We're going to help you get that, that plan done up and done up right. Okay. So with that, do you have any questions, suggestions, or discussion for me? And I'll check the chat as well in case there was something I missed. I have a question. Are you, so are you meeting also with like administration of the schools and also presenting this information? And because um, I feel like in our district, we're still the ones spearheading a lot of the evacuation planning. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like if we aren't identifying our students with disabilities that nobody's paying attention to that factor. So I'm just wondering at what point is it gonna be a whole team awareness versus just therapy awareness? Yeah, um, I will say, we can stop share here now. Um, I will say, yes, yeah, so it's, it, this is, I'll, I'll, I'll give you kind of a brief um, overview of how a lot of our our consultants engage. Typically, it's it's directly with the um, with the school district leadership, primarily the the superintendent, facilities manager, uh, or other folks who are running the the school safety program within the district are contacted first. Um, for an example, we had uh, just last week our consultant or regional rep here in the um, central region we went down and did a site assessment down in, in Lebanon school district. And it started with the superintendent, the facilities uh, manager, and safety officer for that school district, as well as uh, their comms and IT um, director. And we walked through every single school. When we looked at evacuation routes, we looked at bus approaches, we looked at all manner of things, not just for uh, accidents and functional needs, but for general school safety. So these are the things that we want to include. Oh, uh, to, to, to back up there, we also included uh, the, the local law enforcement uh, folks as well in that walkthrough. So that they understand here's what, here's what the situation or here's what the environment looks like inside the building if they had to respond to or help uh, evacuate students and staff out of the building. So yes, this is uh, when we're engaging uh, school districts, we want to make sure that everybody's at the table. People who are planning and who are signing their name on the on the bottom of that plan, here's what, what goes into it. We want to make sure that those things are, are those folks are included in, in the process. 
May I add to that, Alex, if mm -hmm. you don't mind? Uh, you know, to your point, Wendy, that's why we were uh, starting these conversations in our PLT about four years ago, because it was the PLT of being the Lone Ranger in doing these things. And, you know, it's been a long conversation. I feel like uh, we have a good partnership. Um, but the fact that the peep now is coming out of Alex's mouth in different conversations that we now are starting to uh, get some awareness that now uh, you are the ones who are the have been and and are the only ones but because we're talking about it and because we are shouting out successes and uh and we we are whenever you look at some of the training pieces it said and don't forget to consider people with disabilities and so when as I say when we come to that point even somebody you know I don't know if you know Gail Bowser but she and I've been working with some of the slides and presentations but when I said something about it planning when you start thinking about it even somebody who is so intricately aware of the needs of of our kids um, you don't think about all of these things until you come to the table so the awareness is out there and so when we look at and you're making a plan even on a single student level make sure that you're somehow doing a video of it make sure that you're shouting it out because it is in in us talking about it that it is gaining awareness even if it is a little at a time and so uh, that's why we're talking about it and anybody who has any suggestions on how they uh, brought people onto their team uh, this conversation is not over maybe we should devote an entire uh, town hall meeting to these kind of strategies but you're right you have been the lone ranger that's why it can't continue thank you yeah yeah Deb, thanks for that and and Wendy to your point too uh, as well we've seen where where school districts have um, fantastic signage placards uh, evacuation routes posted all manner of emergency procedures posted and there would be simple things that are that just aren't connected and and a lot of times those are identified and mind you we're, we're not we're not the end all be all of everything school emergency management related, but there are a lot of things that uh, sometimes us as as an outsider coming into a school district can see and say, hey, uh, did you think of this? Is this is this uh, included in your plan? And that's why it's important, I think, to, to uh, talk to you all folks here to say, hey, don't forget to to raise your hand and say, hey, please include me in that that planning process, because we can't be present in, in every school district emergency operations plan, planning process, we can be uh, present or at least available for anyone who needs uh, assistance and can reach out to us. And so, yeah, we, we, I think it's important to, to full assault on, on all fronts. Uh, we're, we're engaging the local community emergency responders, we're engaging the school districts, we're engaging folks like yourself, everybody who, who can become made aware to, uh, to be included and participate in that planning process. And we know so many of these things come after a relationship building. And Bruce, I know you're you will tout that that the people you've gotten to know in in construction of the new buildings, etc. Yeah, and and what makes it real? Well, you know, we were talking yesterday. One of the areas that y'all ask a lot about training is uh, transportation, not just. Uh, not just in an evacuation emergency, but always the safe trust uh, training and bus drivers. So Alex and I are thinking about partnering. I hope I'm not talking too soon. Uh, but we think that if we're talking about buses, that we need that training to be you and the bus drivers. So when you look at something and say, here's where it is, let's come together and say, here's some common, uh, here's some solutions. And rather than coming in and saying, hey, we're the expert, then, uh, you know, empowering people because we don't want them to think that we're trying to create something separate. We're trying to help them improve what they're already doing and the chances of them buying in and uh, having it persist within their systems rather than us coming in and saying, hey, we wrote a manual. Hey, how can we add to what you are doing? And so just some thoughts of uh, we want to smoke up a bus and have you on there with the bus drivers and see what does it look like it, it, when the rubber meets the road. So there you go. Um, I actually just have one follow-up question to, to kind of what you said. So we have been working hard in our district and um, 
even trying to get in on the ground level before like architectural plans are being drawn for the schools as they're being remodeled or built, rebuilt. Um, and I think there's always that part, you know, we might meet with them when it's the drawing phase and then we actually meet with them again, like before they kind of do the final, like a final walkthrough where they can still tweak things. Is that a, is that a point that we could potentially reach out to you and bring you and your team in on that as well as a resource? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. I, I don't think there's any, any engagement necessarily too, too big or too small for, for that. Um, but again, a, a, a lot of times um, our, our our process typically starts with a an assessment of the school district. What what are the where are they at capacity wise with with their emergency planning and their preparedness efforts, and then finding ways to to you know plug those gaps and, and fill in those those shortcomings to help wherever that that might be. So if it's yeah, if, if, even if it's something as small as as hey, what what are the what are the transportation obstacles for um, for access and functional needs students? Uh, how, how can we how can we fix those and and uh, bridge those gaps? So Bruce is uh, uh, as always he gets an idea and he runs with it and is a, a leader in every way. But he I know he's been doing peeps. He's been uh, working with the people uh, in construction and there's some things in the chat right now. So Bruce, if you don't mind uh, unmuting, uh, you're already there. Uh, go ahead and share a bit with us if you would. So uh, this is the, uh, can you see the picture? Yes. yes. This, this, this was the first practice session of the new EVAC uh, track sleds that uh, I was able to get for Woodburn. Schools had a bunch of money for COVID funding and they were looking for big projects for SPED. And uh, between that and a new superintendent, I'm trying to stop the share. There we go. Um, they decided I'm glad to they had, see that was a safe landing, Bruce. Uh, uh, well, it didn't hurt too bad. Okay. Uh, um, wait, wait till you see the next time when I wear my crash dummy t-shirt along with the helmet. Uh, I'm prepared. Um, what I wanted to say is that uh, the, the more uh, at the ground level we can get in on building uh, projects, not just for determining what the safety vac routes are going to be or, or other concerns, the better chance for those of us who are PTs can have in getting lifter systems installed. And I'll set that aside for another topic. Uh, this gives me a chance to thank uh, you, Alex and Deb, for bringing this information to the front. Previous to this, I was doing the standard, have the kid wait on the upper level till the fire department gets there and they determine, I know, and it all the um, information that you put out made me realize that I needed to rethink everything. Because of the information on the peeps, et cetera, we are now installing evac track systems. I'm trying to get them in Tigard. We have them in Woodburn. And the peeps are now being written. My assistant, Terry, who's on here, is doing the lion's share of that work and we're attaching them to the IEPs. I think all the IEP software that's being used across the state will allow you to attach additional documents. So these are now part of the record that goes with the students. And we're looking at starting tabletop exercises as part of the IEP program. So we're phasing that in this year. That makes but, me so happy to hear uh, you. I am hoping to get Bruce uh, to do a session in the future, taking us through um, uh, and an actual plan with a de-identified student and talking about what it looks like. And uh, we have a template and now we need to hear stories about how it's working. So thank you for that. And I see a comment from Lori Scott. And Lori, I'm thrilled that you're on with us today. Uh, some of you may remember Lori from joining us. Uh, you're in, on the East Coast, aren't you? Lori, okay, if uh, go ahead and if you would just unmute yourself and thank you for joining us and uh, just tell us who you are and, and what your uh, interest is here. Wow, well, thank you for having me. And as always, I like to dip in and see what's happening on the West Coast. And uh, you guys are doing great work. And that's so awesome to get the stair chairs for kids. And in Maryland, we had to put forward a law in 2017 to 
um, ensure that kids with disabilities were going to be accommodated for at the time of a, an emergency and not be left on stairwell landings, um, which unfortunately happened to my daughter. So um, we do have stair chairs in a lot of our districts, but not in, in all, unfortunately, even with the law. So um, it's great. It, it's a process. It's a journey. And you all have been done doing great work there. And um, and the PEEP is awesome. And really just making sure that families are involved and understanding that how you're going to do your drills and how you're going to accommodate kids um, and staff with disabilities. So thank you so much for letting me weigh in and thank you for all your work. It's awesome to see. That was unprompted. And uh, the fact that she dropped in was uh, is is amazing. Lori, great to see you. And uh, we did a session with Lori about her work on uh, that was, as you said, uh, inspired by your daughter's experiences. And uh, and so thank you for that. We'll put a link to your session that we did in the past. Um, and so other comments and questions. Um, I, I don't know what I'm going to look and see what's in the chat. Um, am I muted? Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so Deb, I, I had a quick question. Well, I don't know if it's quick. But, oh, please um, go right ahead. I've got a couple of points, but I can throw mine in at any time. You go ahead. Go okay. Yeah, yeah. I was just um, thinking about, I know teachers, seem. I think they have a lot of resources on how to talk to students about um, just some of the scarier, well, they're all scary, but um, you know, some of the like active shooter type situations and stuff like that. And I, I was just wondering for my own learning if, you know, Alex or you or, or anyone on here has any good resources on like, how do we talk to kids about this stuff in a, in a developmental age appropriate way without scaring them, but also, um, yeah, I've just, I, I've ended, you know, being itinerant, I've ended up like, oh gosh, we're doing the lockdown drill and I'm with a couple of five-year-olds and um, and the teacher's not there because we were in the hall or something. And I'm like, oh, so what to say <laughs> to them to 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 explain why we're doing this? Because that tends to help them be more um, stay in one place. <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm talking about wiggly kids. <laughs> no, you're I think. No, you're absolutely. It is a major concern for a lot of folks. That's why uh, we had this up here for a little bit more creative solutions. Um, yeah. Preserve you because I had some notes in here as well. So, um, like I said, Claire uh, Claire Ranch, she's out of Columbia Gorge, but she has her own consultant company um, uh, as well, and she's developed this Sammy the Sasquatch um, creative approach uh, to um, to provide a, a way to talk to kids uh, about those lockdown drills before running, you know, doing that walk and then run through. Mm -hmm. And, and she has a way of presenting some of this information with this storybook, um, as well as an in-classroom instruction. So I'd recommend reaching out to her. Oh, cool. Like I said, there's um, there are some other ones. I'm not scared, I'm prepared. I know that by Julia Cook, uh, you looked that up on, on Amazon. Uh, a lockdown drill at Superhero School by Tamara Ritter, Ritter's House. Um, both, I know uh, I got recommendations for those from our folks out in the Southeast region. They'd use those those materials as well to uh, great success for for younger kids and um, kids who needed a, a slower, uh, more methodical approach to introducing some of these things. So th there there's some stuff out there. Um, I will say I'm not as familiar with how, how you might be able to pay for some of these things. But uh, Claire was saying that with her content or her material, if you're buying it in bulk, she can get it at cost. So I would contact her if, and and even if it's something that you just want to find out what her process is, contact her and, and say, hey, I want to talk with you about about that process and, and how you introduce that material. And she would be happy to do that um, as <laughs> as a rep with the program without without cost. So so the material that she has, has created independently is cost, but not the information on how to, how to present it. That. Oh, cool. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. And if anybody else has any resources, uh, Bruce probably doesn't have one yet, but he'll be uh, creating a video uh, in the near future. He's, that's what he does. I say that lovingly, friend. Um, but I also, um, you know, I, I'm not going to say that virtual reality is is good for everybody, but I know that my uh, nephew, who is on the spectrum, when he was going to fly, uh, it helped us to find something that kind of simulated an experience. Now, I'm not going to say that you want to take somebody 
through a hurricane. Um, but if it, it, but for him, uh, seeing something and, and being able to feel like walking onto the plane and saying hi to the pilot, uh, it it made a big difference. So I'm not going to say definitely that there is anything VR, um, but it might be something to look at. Um, and the other thing. <sighs> I've heard from people who work in, and the, one of the people here in our office who is, is a Coast Guard, um, talk about the most difficult plan and the, pe the piece that people don't pay enough attention to is the reunification plan. And obviously we talk about um, the transportation to get there, but I also think that as, as planned as people might be, um, I want to know who's getting a copy and how in an emergency somebody's going to know what this student needs. And so across the state, let's say you've got a team in a community and they've all determined these are the, the processes. Bruce's student now has a plan. Now, he could send out a paper copy, which is not going to be good in an emergency. He can, uh, you know, digital copy that somebody can refer to. And I'm just wondering, is there something um, or is there something and you know it may not go on a wheelchair because sometimes kids get separated from their wheelchair but is there something that is like a QR code or is something you know how is this communicated whenever the people who know about it may not be anywhere near uh, that day it could be your third person in line to help so I'm wondering too is there a recognizable something is it a keychain that every emergency person says, oh, this kid's got a peep. Let me pick this up. It's got a QR code and now I'm going to queue right into it. So now these may be things that, you know, somebody's already got going or is there something uh, that can help people in an emergency knowing to know what to do? De De I, I want to uh, talk about this for just a second. Uh, before <laughs> before the questions pop up, because this is one of those really big big, big ones. Uh, the reunification. Like, uh, our, our partner up in Clackamas, Dan Krause, is, always says, it's one of those that nobody gets right the first time. Uh, it's it's a it's normally a, a big mess. But planning, having a plan ahead of time uh, helps tremendously. Uh, the I Love You Guys Foundation, for some of you who may already be familiar with, have that has the standard reunification model as well. Um, we've had them out uh, recently um, last summer out in high desert uh, territory out in uh, uh, southeastern, well, from, from the Bend area, uh, down south, uh, we had them out. Um, if you're able to find out, and we'll, we'll if any time we have them come out again, uh, we'll, I'll share with Deb and see if we can't get that information out to everybody. Because typically, uh, once they're brought out and paid for it, it's free to anybody else who, who shows up for the training. And it's phenomenal, phenomenal training, because they literally walk you through from start to finish, Here's what it looks like. And then actually physically, you will, will participate in a reunification exercise um, during that during that period. Oh, uh, us in. That sounds great. Yes. Well, that I, may I seem would... too enthusiastic for emergency planning, <laughs> but I love the idea. The, this is one of those, yeah, this is one of those that it, it's important to have a procedure and process in place for reunification because, yeah, I, Kelly, what you said here, you have kids stranded. It could be any number of situations where you need to have a, a, a robust system in place for how to get those kids back to their, their families um, appropriately and, and safely. Uh, but I will say this, uh, really important stuff that they have with the standard reunification model. We would like to be able to sponsor bringing them out. We can't pay for them uh, while we're on our last little few months of the grant. But if we're able to get state funding, that's one of those things that we would like to kind of make make a routine is bring them out on a, on a more routine basis to to spread the uh training around the state uh, so everybody has access to it uh for those we'd be you willing like... to partner with you to make that happen so okay. if we pull, pull our nickels together maybe we can do it i was going to say others other districts and this is this might be something you can run through your finance or your your, your uh, district leadership uh other folks have worked with pace to help uh subsidize or, or help uh, cover the cost of bringing them out to conduct a full training. Um, I would I would absolutely recommend if you're able to to get that done, uh, check check on it and see if you can't uh, involve yourselves in that as well. Because if you had a contact name, I, if you had a contact name, you could share with me or do an email introduction. That would be great. 
Sure. Thank you. So that was my plug. So. Okay. We're going to open it up for questions. As you've been listening, we know that you are thinking about your uh, most complicated students. And uh, if you haven't been already, we hope that you are including them in a plan. Who needs a plan? Well, basically, the, what is in the training at the national level uh, and, uh, and applies to all of us is somebody who has uh, procedural difficulties, somebody who has mobility issues, and somebody who has vision. Uh, so along with procedural might be um, a comprehension and understanding rules and uh, being able to uh, even coming down to being able to self-soothe in an emergency. Um, those kind of things. If you know that any one of those three areas are going to be uh, a problem or present an issue in an emergency, how if we can't see it, how if we can't navigate it, and how if we can't understand uh, what is expected of, of us, and uh, particularly if it's a student who's been given a buy in the past uh, because they don't like loud noises, and I hope that's reducing. I hope that um, people are finding ways to put something in their memory bank. Um, it's too late whenever you're in the middle of it uh, to try and find solutions to calm yourself. So if I speak out of uh, school on any of that, I'm not a therapist. <laughs> so I don't know your perspective, but I sure welcome Heidi's comments. Heidi, go I ahead. I have a question because uh, we started these conversations a few years ago at TIES, but during that during those conversations it was brought up about knowing what to put with the child who has a handicap that's like in a wheelchair is there any resources of ways that things can be put on wheelchairs or whatever and so that the teachers and staff members know what needs to be in that resource because like here we live on the Oregon coast and they always talk about a tsunami warning well one of our schools is literally like a mile walk up a hill and, you know, and it's like, what kind, how do we help these teachers prepare what needs to be on that chair so that they're prepared when it's time to go? Are you, you talking have, about this, the go bag that we've talked about? Yeah, the go okay. bags. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that and, is consideration that is part of the PEEP. But again, we keep coming back to that. But uh, when you look at uh, that, Bruce probably could expound on the go bag uh, from his experience, but it's really looking at everything that they need. Go ahead, Bruce. Medication. Um, Can't forget that. Go ahead. Well, or, or Chewy's, you know, sensory stuff. It, th there's a lot. When we do the peeps, we, we use Google Docs and we share the doc with the parent and have them either add specific things or comments, depending on, on what the parent chooses to do. But in the go bag, that's the time that we have the parent think through. Is it a, a, a child who's G-tube fed? Uh, do they need extra uh, feeding supplies? Is it a kid who's suction? Do they need extra catheters? So it's like we tell them, think through eight to 12 hours, what supplies would the your child need? And we try to have them put together a go bag that goes in the backpack with the wheelchair primarily. I know I'm the ASD, the kids with ASD are the next group we'll start to work with. And I'm sure there's gonna be all kinds of sensory things that are needed in headphones to block out the sounds of the sirens, et cetera. But I've been primarily as a PT focusing to start on the kids with orthopedic issues. But get the, get the parents to tell you uh, to think through if, if your child wasn't home for 12 hours, what would they need with them to keep them safe? And, and what kind of ways have you, I mean, you talk about a go bag, Bruce, but is there a way that you can provide some examples of things that you found that are kind of working? Do you, Heidi, I think you're asking like what physical yeah. or system do you have attached to either a wheelchair or other thing? <laughs> Not just like what the contents are, but what actual physical bag or- Correct. Like yeah. And where, where are you storing them in the classroom or, or, or what has anybody thought that through? Because- that kind of stuff would be really helpful. I was going to say it's a Ziploc. I mean, in, in the cases of the parents that have put it together, I think universally it's a Ziploc bag, and it's in for the students we've done them with. It's on. It's in their bag, in their uh, wheelchair bag. 
So it's pre-packed, it's not in the classroom, it's with the student. Again, when we get to the kids that are uh, that are mobile, but have sensory needs, that'll, then I'm going to have to answer the question that you're asking. And it depends on what it is. Uh, certainly if it was a stuffy uh, that was a huge teddy bear, I mean, that's not going, uh, you got different situations there. Um, but, and Bruce, your microphone seemed to be kind of wonky a couple of times. I know you'd want to know that. Um, I understood everything that you said, but you got some wonky. So does anybody else have any uh, I, uh, questions about the go bag? And it's a great question because unless you've seen one and what the strategies are, and Chris, your nurses um, are, are responsible for the medical piece of that. Do you want to share any more about that? Unmute yourself. Okay, sorry, just trying to unmute. Um, I'm kind of in a different setting, so I'm not going to be uh, visible, but um, yeah, we had this discussion about go bags. And to be honest, you're not going to, in emergency, you're not going to be grabbing a bag with any kind of stuffed animal in it. So if it's, if they have something that's medical, um, that's medically needed, like a diastat, or, uh, you know, if they eat only with a tube feeding, then those kids are already identified by the nurse and um, they work more what I'm going to call at the office level of knowing that they have these big carts that they have to take. Cause think about all the kids they have that are diabetic. So the go bag, when we talk about go bags in our school district, it is strictly emergency and we're not going to try to grab something that they need unless it's on them, you know, unless it's medical, then it's, and it's not being taken care of by the paraeducators and the teachers who are going to be responsible for the whole other classroom kids. And I didn't mean to make light of what was going in there by talking about, but if there if there is something that soothes a child, and Bruce, maybe you can say, um, it, you know, if if there is, if you talk to the family and they and they say that, well, the only thing that will calm them down is this. Well, if that doesn't fit in the go bag, what is Plan B? Um, and so I didn't mean to make light of that comment. When, and thank you for that. Bruce, do you have any? Is it like jewelry? Is it like those kind of things that? Uh, and I guess you really don't know that since you haven't worked with this population. No, but yet. that's what I'm expecting. I've talked to some of the autism specialists to try to pre-plan uh, what kind of changes we're going to need to the peeps as we look at a mobile population with sensory needs. And that was something that came up consistently. And most of the families have something portable because that's what they use when they go out in the community. And it'll be a question of either the family or possibly the, the district buying some extras. It's kind of just interesting um, use of terminology too. And I don't know what Alex thinks, but um, maybe a, a go emergency go bag is more, I mean, is it more medical or is it more about, you know, like the soothing things that a kid might need? Because, you know, on one hand, there's a you, 100% you have to have it, you know, life or death medical need, or just like this would be great if they did have it. Um, and, you know, maybe to get suggestions from parents, but also not tell them that it's a hundred percent, you're going to have it because like, you know, Alex was saying, we've not experienced these extreme emergencies before. How do you know if you're going to have time to get all the stuff you, you know, that you say you're going to get and who's going to be trained? Yeah, I think, uh, I think Bruce is on it with that. It, it, it should be necessity for, for keeping that kid safe and, and healthy in, in one piece, right? That should be the priority. Um, I like the idea of yeah, including the, the parents in the process, but yeah, at a certain point, if it yeah, gets a little bit out of control, you're going to have to essentially triage what, what goes into and what, what you can actually accommodate on, on an evacuation or, or other extended like reunification kind of setting where you're going to be sitting there for a while uh, while, while people are processing through. So I, I think you, you really just got to, it's going to be a case by case basis. I mean, but prioritize what's going to keep that kid alive, healthy, and safe. And that's why I bring this up because I think even when you're talking with parents, those same things, those same uh, comments are going to be there. So this is what we should be saying. It's about eight to 12 hours, what keeps them alive? 
And Lori, I see you had a comment about what you used as the kind of bags in your projects across Maryland. Um, do you have any comment about what you see as uh, uh, contents of go bags? Well, and she may be looking for the unmute button or she may have stepped away. So uh, anyway, um, necessity, this is uh, where it's coming from. What's going I, to keep you safe for the next 12 hours? Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, there was another uh, thought I just had. I remember um, with the uh, I Love You Guys Foundation, when they do their uh, standard reunification model training, that is one of the things they they bring up, uh, kind of like a, a go container if you will or, or otherwise that you might have next year reunification box that says hey this goes out with the the fidget spinners the the things that might keep kids occupied in a in a space uh for an extended period of time so if you have some of those things maybe, maybe that's something you just have as like an emergency stash and say hey once we've relocated whoever the staff member is who's going back and grabbing those additional supplies to bring out to the site um, if if they if available, obviously, <laughs> you, you you grab those as well. <laughs> I was saying the same thing because maybe some places have they evacuate to a specific site, like mm -hmm. a neighboring church or something. And maybe collaborating with that building, do they have a space to store like a reunification kit? They would have like noise canceling headphones, a few fidget things or sensory things, blankets, you know, weighted blankets, things that might just be possibly really necessary for some kids to just you know cope um, and they're probably going to find not just the kids who would need it but there's going to be other kids who might benefit from it uh but just thinking about that ahead of time you know so they actually have a how are we going to handle all this mass of kids all of a sudden for that long of a time for people you know uh, just a <laughs> Good point, Leslie. You don't have to have it on your person, but if you know where mm -hmm. everybody's headed, maybe it could be there. And Bruce, I know you wanted to say something about evacuation routes, but I also wanted to comment on your last comment uh, when you said uh, one of the populations, of course, we need to have a plan for is somebody whose communication is not typical. And so OGCOM, if somebody's using OGCOM, if their device doesn't come with them, you know, backup plans. But I also wanted to say that we had uh, Julia Beam from, I think it was a University of Colorado, uh, did a session on planning with OGCOM. And so, Bruce, I'm going to let you talk about evac, ask you, invite you to please talk about evacuation routes. Um, and I'm going to see if I can find the links to Julia's session about OGCOM and then, of course, Lori's session uh, that, that she did for us previously. Go ahead, Bruce. Okay, hopefully my microphone's better now. You hear me okay? So far, so good. Okay. Um, so whenever I whenever I talk to groups about things, I primarily talk about the mistakes I made because unfortunately we all start at zero and we have to learn. In the process of putting together the peeps, Terry, uh, my assistant and I started walking the routes and we discovered stuff even in buildings we'd been in for decades that we didn't know for instance, missing curb cuts where they needed to be because we never walked out, say, to the tennis courts where the evac routes go, or thinking that because a building had exits at, that went to ground, uh, that went out to the street at all levels meant that we didn't have to plan special evac routes. We found out that, that some of the classrooms use the stairs to go to a lower part of the building to evac, so the student in a wheelchair needed an alternative route. So what we've done is we've walked every building and determined at what point in the building where the exit would be, and then looked at the existing fire evac routes, which are widely posted in the building and seeing where it varies. And so part of what we have in the peeps is a, a spreadsheet that says where the where the student would use the same evacuation procedure and where they would use something different. And then we have a separate column as we add the evacu track um, for, for those procedures. So what I'm saying in a long-winded way is walk your buildings, even if you think you know them really well, you may discover that the classroom door out to the outside goes to a gravel path or the, the path is only partly paved or uh, et cetera. And unless you are, 
really fine grained about it. You'll assume that things will work and, and then when an emergency comes, they won't. I'm gonna say one other thing, that plans have to be widely disseminated. We had an instance where even though I thought we had trained people on how to get a student in a wheel, what to do when a student in a wheelchair was in the second level of our high school, teachers improvised and tried to carry her in her wheelchair down the stairs and dumped her. Uh, thankfully, there were no legal actions, but it, it taught me that it's not just the special ed staff. You need to educate all the teachers on that level of the building so they don't try to do something that to them seems like a good idea, but has nothing to do with the actual plan for the student. Thanks. We have had so much to think about today. I know some of you have been living and breathing these thoughts uh, with your students because you know them. You know, whenever uh, things turned upside down in COVID, you had in your mind who was going to have a rough time uh, being at home. You know these students intimately. How uh, are you going to keep them safe no matter what the emergency might be? Well, it's not all up to you. It may have been in the past, but that's not okay. It's never been okay. And it is your voice and it is your coming to the table. Uh, I'm starting to get known in my circles of saying, well, whose voice are we missing at this table? Um, but it's yours if you're not in the planning uh, for these kids. And so uh, it seems like a lot to be on your shoulders, uh, but we don't, uh, we don't have to bear this alone. You have a, a statewide community of people here behind you who are sharing ideas. Uh, I may uh, wear my rose colored glasses, I tend to, but I think that these are the ways uh, with our partnerships uh, that we make a change. And what we are talking about uh, is resonating across Oregon, but know that we are being heard in different parts of the country. I know that um, uh, we are gathering, I get emails from people wanting to know how we, uh, how we built what we have. And it is really by saying we are listening. And uh, so we are. Uh, give us your feedback on this. You'll receive a survey and you can stop the recording, Chandra. Um, you will receive a, a survey that 